Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. I don't know how it is around your house, but around my patio, things gather that I don't want to see. Tools for gardening, things for the grill, and I don't want to lug them back into the garage. Well, today I have a way to solve that problem. We're going to build an outdoor cupboard. The thing I want to start on today is the frame. It provides a structure to which I can attach the siding and the back, plus it gives support to these adjustable shelves. There are three frames, one on each end and one in the middle. The end ones are made out of pressure treated lumber because they make contact with the ground. What I did is bought two by fours and then ripped them into one and a half inch square pieces. I've taken all the vertical pieces and clamped them together and provided some layout where they're going to join with the horizontals. I'm going to use lap joints for all the connections, so I've put the stack dado in the radial arm and I've run some samples to make sure I'm removing just half of the material. I've ganged them together because it'll be much easier to do all the pieces at once instead of one at a time. Before we use any power tools though, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. The roof is pitched at 10 degrees, therefore the half lap at the top of the frame has to be made at 10 degrees. I started by cutting the stock to length at the miter saw, which is set at 10 degrees. That gives me an angle on each end. Now I've swung the radial arm to 10 degrees and installed a stop so that I'll remove just the right amount of material. Here I'm drilling some 3 8 inch diameter holes in the vertical frame members, about three inches on center, for pins to support the shelves. Now we're ready for a little assembly, and I'm just putting a dab of polyurethane glue at each joint. And I'll put the pieces together and secure them with a one and a quarter inch screw, one at each intersection. Sixty-three and thirteen. That's good. The piece is nice and square. Let's let these cook for a while and take another look at the prototype. I covered the ends and made the doors with western red cedar, the tongue and groove material sold as paneling. Now I didn't like the scale. It's too broad for the size of this piece. So what I did is I actually put a V groove right down the middle of each piece. This piece of three quarter inch AC plywood is the floor for the cupboard and these notches are to fit around the frame. With one side attached to the bottom, I can slip the other one in place, a little bit of glue and some screws hold it together. Now for the center frame, and that gets attached with some screws through the bottom. Now this piece of plywood is for the roof. And I've just beveled the back edge because I want it to match the slope of the frame and give me a flat place to attach the plywood back. You'll notice I've placed the C side of the plywood facing up. That's going to be covered with rubber. The A side is on the inside where we're going to see it. Now even though this back is only a piece of quarter inch plywood, it's really going to stiffen this frame. I'm just going to attach it with glue and staples. Well now it's time to start putting on some siding. I took one piece and ripped off the edge with the groove. 
I've cut the top at a 10 degree angle to match the pitch of the roof. I don't need a real tight fit up here. That's going to be covered by the roof trim later. And I'm just going to hold it flush to the front of the 2x4 frame and nail it with some galvanized inch and a half finish nails. With all the siding on the end, I've now laid out the bottom for the cutout, which will give me a little air space under the piece. I'll trim it with a circular saw and a jigsaw. Now here's a piece of one by four cedar that trims off the header. I'll just nail that in place. Now here I'm just marking the length of the trim that's going to go around the roof. The front corners are mitered. And I'm simply going to miter those at the table saw with the blade tip 45 degrees. A little bead of glue where it meets the plywood and I'll secure it with some two inch finish nails. Now here I'm marking the length of the side piece. I'm going to add an inch and cut it at 10 degrees. Now this piece is for the back edge of the roof and once again I've tipped the saw blade to 10 degrees to match the pitch. Okay, this fits between the end boards and I want to make sure that it's flush to the trim and the plywood. Well now I'm ready to put some roofing material on to make it waterproof. Now, I suppose I could have used rolled roofing or asphalt shingles or even wood shingles, but we had a piece of this EDPM membrane roofing left over from an old, this old house project. Just a thin rubber, very flexible, and it's resistant to UV light, so it's going to last for a long time. In fact, you use it a lot on flat decks. It's installed using an adhesive, much like a contact cement. It's a latex adhesive, water cleanup, and I'm just going to roll a coat on the rubber and some on the plywood and when both pieces are dry and tacky I can stick them together. When I was designing the piece we were thinking about an area where we could have a little work surface. A place to put the tools or do a little potting. Thought about putting it inside the door but that idea didn't work very well. We thought about taking part of the side and having it flip up but then it would get damaged. So I came up with this concealed unit that goes on the back of the case. There's a little stop at the top and the work surface slides out through a couple brackets at the back on a plywood beam and then it folds down and it sits on a doll pin in the corner. First thing I want to do is make this plywood beam. The beam is made up of two pieces of three quarter inch MDO plywood. I chose plywood for this beam because it won't distort and warp and it's a lot stronger than a solid piece of wood. I'll secure it with some screws. That beam slides through a series of blocks. I made these out of some scrap mahogany, one and a half inches square, and I pre-drilled for some screws and they go right into the framework. These strips of mahogany get screwed to the blocks and they keep the beam from pulling away from the back of the cabinet. Well, before I continue with that beam, the contact cement seems to be tacky, so I want to get this membrane on. I don't want to let it dry too much. And I'll tell you, this stuff is unbelievably sticky. Now, I found when I built the prototype should stretch the material, just sort of work it on so that you don't have bubbles from one edge to the other. All right, success. Now, I'm going to take J roller and go from the center up to the edges 
Just to make sure I got a good bond. Using a straight edge and a sharp knife, I'll trim it off. Let's take another look at the prototype. The beam slides through the brackets that I just installed. At each end of the beam, there's a piece of cedar which supports this one and a half inch square piece of spruce. Now, because I have hinges here, I have to relieve the spruce for the knuckle of the hinge. So I've set up the table saw, and I'll just make a quick pass through the piece. Now we'll attach the beam to the piece of spruce with the cedar on the end. Now I can slide the beam through and attach the other end. That works fine. Now tomorrow we'll build the shelf, make some doors, and build the trellises. And this piece will be ready to fill. Well, good morning. I got started today pre-cutting the pieces for that pull-out shelf. And let's take another look at it on the prototype. If you look at the underside, you see a plywood face. It's actually three-quarter inch plywood. The manufacturer of the plywood has applied a paper facing. It's called medium density overlay. It's sold in home centers and used as soffit material frequently. And sign makers love it because it's nice and smooth and it takes paint great. Now, if you couldn't find this, you could use AC plywood, exterior grade plywood. So that the edges don't show, I've wrapped it with cedar. I've attached it to the base of plywood with biscuits and glue, and I've also biscuited the corners. At the back edge, there's a piece of 2x2 two two stock for the hinges. First thing I want to do is attach that piece of 2x2, two two, a little bit of glue, and some screws. Now pull out the biscuit joiner to make the slots to attach the trim. Now there's many ways to attach the trim. I could simply glue it and nail it. I could glue it and screw it with some plugs. But I like to use the biscuits because it makes a stronger connection between the two pieces. And it's simple. Now, there is a little forgiveness side to side when I make the cut. There's a little extra room for the biscuit, but none up and down. Years ago, carpenters had no convenient way of reinforcing these miter joints. Even with glue and screws and nails, they tend to open up with time. But biscuits have helped solve some of those problems. Each tool has a slightly different fence. This one, I put the mark on the inside of the miter drop it into the fence which holds it at the right angle, line it up with the center mark, and cut the biscuit slot. Well, now we're ready to put this together. And this glue bottle is very convenient. It has a little plunger, and it measures the right amount of glue into the slot. This one we got from the manufacturer of our plate joiner. Here, just as I did with the prototype, I'm clamping the pieces on, depending on the glue and biscuits to hold the trim in place. Not using mechanical fasteners means I won't have any holes to fill. And why use them if you don't have to? While the shelf cooks, let's look at the prototype and start working on the doors. There were two ways that I could have designed this piece. I could have built a face frame and hung the doors in between, or do what I did here, was make it look like the siding is continuous right around the corner. So I made a joint right at the edge of one of the V-grooves, and that's where the hinge is located. I want to mortise these hinges into the door and to the fixed piece, because if I just use the screws, that means the weight of the door is hanging on the screws. By making a mortise, I have a shoulder, and that adds a lot of strength to the unit. What I've done is taken four pieces of siding, rip them to the right width. 
These long pieces are the fixed style, and they have to be longer because they go all the way down to the base of the unit. The shorter pieces are for the doors, the first piece on each door, the left and right door. I've laid out the mortises for the hinges, and I'm going to make the mortise by simply using the table saw. I've set the blade at a very shallow height. In fact, it matches the thickness of the hinge. I'm going to use my miter gauge to guide it through. I've put marks right on the edge so that I can line it up with the blade, looking over the front, run it through, and clean out the material in between. On each end piece that I just mortised, I need to cut a taper. I've laid it out. I'll cut it at the table saw. Well, let's take another look at the prototype and see how the paneling is held together for the door. It's a Z-brace system, very traditional in doors like this, attached with screws. So what I've done is taken all the pieces for the door, set them on the bench face side down, and clamp them because of slight variations in the siding. I clamp it and make sure that the measurement is the same at all three clamp locations, which is also where I'm going to put these cleats. I'm going to attach the cleats with screws, no glue. I want the pieces to be able to expand and contract with changes in humidity. The last piece, which is on the latch side of the door, was too small to actually pick up on the cleat. So I'm just going to glue it and nail it in place with some brads. Let's take another look at the prototype and the diagonal piece of the Z-brace. It must be supported by the hinge, both at the middle and at the bottom. Otherwise, the outside edge of the door can drop down under its own weight. Now, let me show you how I lay out the angle. I take a piece of the material I'm going to use, line it up with the corner of the brace at each end, and then take a bevel gauge and set it to the angle. Now I can take the bevel gauge, set it on the miter saw, and set the angle. This is where my laser comes in handy, because I can bring it right along the edge of the bevel gauge. And the angle is just a little over 36 degrees. Now I bring the piece back to the door, line it up on one corner, and then mark the underside, bring it back to the miter saw, and cut it. Okay, that's good. Now we'll attach that with some screws. Hinges are next. First, I attach them to the piece that I'm going to fix to the case, and then to the door. I found on the prototype it was easier to take the whole assembly and nail it onto the frame. I've put a little bit of glue on the corner, tighten that joint up, and just slip it into place, push it up to the top, and nail it. Okay, now we'll build one more door the same way. Now I'm getting back to that flip down shelf. I'm using a pair of hinges to attach the shelf to the sliding beam. Okay, that's good. Now, in order to hold the shelf against the back of the cabinet when it's stored, the first thing I have to do is install the slot. And now, another piece which just laps down to hold everything in place. Now, to support the shelf, I'm putting in a half-inch dowel pin. And you can see that when I pull everything out, it just drops right down on that pin, and that's the support. The wooden hardware for the doors that I made for the prototype worked out pretty well. Now, let me show you the different pieces. There's a latch piece, which pivots off of this screw. There's a little bit of a handle, so you can raise it up and down. There's this keeper, and there's a catch. All wood, except for the screws.
Well, that takes care of shaping the latch. I've attached a little handle to the latch with a screw from the back. Now I set it on the door and just bring it onto the catch just a bit, line it up, and attach it with a screw. Now there's a little filler strip that goes between the doors that brings everything out flush. I just attach that with some brads. There are two trellises on the outdoor cupboard, one on the side and one on the roof. I've pre-cut the stock to length and laid it out, and I simply use one screw at each intersection. Now I've made some standoffs to hold the trellis away from the side of the case, and they're just pieces of three-quarter inch stock with a through hole. Now we'll just attach it. Here's the trellis for the roof, assembled the same way as the one that's on the end. A couple screws at the top through the rubber into the plywood will hold it in place, and I don't have to worry about leaks because the rubber will seal the screw. Okay, now for the shelves, I've cut up some more three-quarter inch thick plywood, notched the back edges to fit around the frame, and put some cedar on the front to cover up the exposed plywood. They can either sit on the cross members of the frame or on some dowel pins that go in those holes that I drilled earlier. Well, I'd say that the woodworking for this project is complete. Now we've got to take it outside and load it up. Well, this cupboard is turning out to be great. I found a couple more things to put inside. Got an extra length of hose, some tennis balls to throw for the dog, pots, a trowel, extra tank for the grill, and some gardening tools.